Hello and welcome to the 38th lecture on the history of modern India, the miscellaneous of Janta government. Looking back on the three years of the Janta regime, one analyst remembered it as a chronicle of confused and complex party squabbles, intra-party rivalries, shifting alliances, defections, charges and countercharges of incompetence and the corruption and humiliation of persons who had come to power after the defeat of Mrs. Gandhi. Most Indians who lived through those years would make the same assessment. If more succinctly, the Janta party, they would say, were merely a bunch of jokers. But beyond the fighting and squabbling, the Janta government made a notable contribution to the Indian democracy by remarkable success in repairing the constitution from the emergency's depredations. It was the first coalition central government and proved that the Congress could be defeated. In this video, we will discuss Janta government's efforts to undo the damage to democracy and various movements enriching the democracy. Let us first discuss the mammoth task of undoing the emergency excesses. The initiative here was taken by Murarji Desai. In an interview, on the eve of 1977, he remarked that during the emergency, democracy itself had been vasectomized. If his party won, they would work for the removal of fear which has enveloped the people. Then they would undertake to rectify the constitution. Murarji was clear that we will have to ensure that emergency like this can never be imposed. No government should be able to do so. After Janta Party's victory, the job of repairing the constitution was supervised by the hard-working law minister Shanti Bhushan. The key amendment to be overturned was the 42nd amendment. To replace its defiling provisions, two fresh amendments were drafted, which reverted the term of parliament and state assemblies to five years, restored the right of the Supreme Court to advocate on the election mattress, limited the period of president's rule in the states, and made mandatory the publications of parliamentary and legislative proceedings. Moreover, it made the promulgation of a state of emergency much more difficult. Any such act had now to be approved by a two-third majority in the parliament, had to be renewed every six months after a fresh vote on it and had to be in response to an armed rebellion rather than a mere internal disturbance, as was previously the case. These changes were intended to curb the arbitrary powers of the executive and to restore the rights of the courts, in effect to restore the constitution to what it was before Mrs. Gandhi's emergency era amendments. Drafting of these amendments took time because of the demands of legal precision and the need to ensure the kind of cross-party support that would make their passing in both houses of parliament possible. The damage was undone by the freshly drafted 44th amendment. When this was passed by a comfortable majority on 7 December 1978, among those voting for it were two old rivals, Murarji Desai and Indira Gandhi. Let us now look at the various movements during late 1970s. In 1978, there was a major conference of socialist feminists in Bombay, which focused on the growing violations of women's rights. Campaigns were launched against dowry and rape, against male alcoholism and sexual abuse it frequently resulted in and for better working conditions for women laboring in factories and household units. This new wave of feminism was widespread as well as wide ranging with groups active in many states mobilizing support through public rallies, street theater, poster campaigns and house to house canvassing. The late 70s also saw the assertion 
of a vigorous environmental movement. Peasants launched struggle in defense of their forest rights. Tribals protested against their displacement by large industrial projects and fisher folk opposed trawlers that were depleting the fish stocks of the oceans. In these protests, two things stood out. The leading role of women, who themselves bore the brunt of ecological degradation, and the fact, unlike in the West where the concern for nature was couched in aesthetic terms and voiced by the middle class, this was an environmentalism of the poor driven by rural communities for whom access to the gifts of nature was linked to their survival. An engineer named Kapil Bhattacharya decided to form an association for the protection of democratic rights. The emergency inspired the formation of other such groups based in Delhi, Bombay, Hyderabad and elsewhere. Some focused on civil liberties the violation by the state of the basic human rights of its citizens. Others worked with a broader concept of democratic rights, which took the right to life and liberty guaranteed by the constitution, also to mean the right to better wages and working conditions and to gainful employment itself. The trade union movement, which had historically focused on the factory sector, now began working among the miners and laborers in household and cottage industries. Among the more notable initiatives was that Chhattisgarh Mine Works Stramik Sangh, whose leader Shankar Guhan Yogi sought to blend the ideas of Gandhi and Marx. The mines where the CMSS was active serviced the great public sector steelworks at Bilai. Working with miners of a chiefly tribal background, Niyogi campaigned for equal pay for women workers and against alcohol abuse by men, set up school for children and struggled to make the mine owners pay as much attention to health and safety to a decent living wage. Accompanying and complementing these movements was a new kind of Indian press. For the end of the emergency, unleashed the energies of journalists as only the struggle for national independence had done before. Censorship was dead. There were now no limits to what reporters and editors could write about or to the length of their stories. It also helped that the first offset presses arrived in India in the 1970s. No longer had type to be laboriously set in a hot metal no longer had journals to be printed in the bigger towns and cities alone. Two somewhat contradictory trends were apparent in the India of the late 1970s. On the one hand, there was an increasing fragmentation of the polity as manifest in the rapid turnover of governments. With fewer exceptions, politicians and parties had abandoned ideologies for expediency and principle for profit. On the other hand, there were new forms of social assertion among historically subordinated groups such as low castes, women and unorganized workers. There was now for the first time an active civil liberties movement. The press, which during the emergency had mostly been cowed without a fight, had become livelier than ever before. Viewed from the more formal, purely political side, it appeared that Indian democracy was being corroded and degraded. If one took a more social view, it appeared that Indian democracy was in fact being deepened and enriched. But when all this was happening, as discussed in the last video, Charan Singh had played a wrong card by taking Indira Gandhi's support to topple Murarji Desai. In our next video, we will discuss how Charan Singh was toppled shortly and how Indira Gandhi restored herself to Prime Minister's chair once again. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and comment because discussion is solution. For more discussions, please subscribe our channel.